Hey YouTube, this is part two of my how I quickly and effectively create realistic fur tutorial. Part two, painting this painting right here. For those of you who did not see part one, I'll pop a little card right up here. It'll pop up on the screen in your YouTube viewer and you'll be able to click that and go straight to part one so that you don't you know, be completely lost about what I'm doing. For the rest of you guys, let's move on into it. Okay, so we're back into it, and what I've done here is I've taken a little bit of red violet, and I actually desaturated just a little bit, not nearly enough, um, although it's not an issue right now, and you notice how lightly I'm spraying, catching a couple of spots off the forehead, and you'll see that uh, red violet mix over there on the left-hand side, and you'll see that it's entirely too vibrant if I get full coverage. Uh, that's not going to be an issue where I'm using it over the top and that section in the eyes got another color going on top of it. It's not an issue there because I can easily come back and desaturate. I've still got more color layers to go on top of this. And I'm also spraying very, very gently. So it is important to note sometimes you gotta get that subtlety in. And if you look at the, you can see a little bit of that reference photo hanging out and, and you can start to look over there, you can see those little violet undertones in the hair and so i'm going to put those in now and then we're going to bring in those darker or auburn looking tones um, on top of that remember this is the point which i was talking about before that it is um you know that picture is way overexposed so some of my colors are going to vary from what the reference photo shows um so, you know, don't get too hung up on the color I'm using versus the color of my picture. I've got other colors that I'm using. I'm simply using my reference for my shape and structure right now. And I'm not even 100% replicating that. Of course, using my ultra super cool an awesome piece of poster board freehand shield there and you know still working in these violets i'm going to go in there and and even if i get a little extra violet in a couple of spots it's not a big deal because i'm about to come in with some erasing and then i'm going to be coming in with those darker brown tones shortly after that Now you're going to see me come in here and I'm going to start to pull back out those coloring. And it's important to note, if you notice that, remember that initial base layer of color I put in there. When I am scratching out at this point, I'm not going all the way back to white. So because that paint had a little bit of time to set up, when I'm scratching back, that's coming back and leaving, exposing a shifted color tone that I would laid in the base layer. So the layers that you're seeing exposed aren't necessarily white. There are a few spots where it scratches all the way back through to the white, but it's not in every location. Now I have mixed up... Um, I've do not remember the exact mix I used here. I know I used a little bit of umber and I mixed that with something else. Not sure off the top of my head. Um, that's not really get too hung up on the exact colors I'm using because those are only gonna be specific to each individual picture. And for those of you who've been watching me for a while, you know you can always go check out my color theory video. You should be getting pretty comfortable mixing whatever color you want. Um, for those of you that aren't that have not watched me for a while, if you go down into my playlist, I have a video on color theory, which pretty much teaches you how to mix any color, and that's an ongoing series that's going to be over a period of time. Notice that I use that shield there on that hair, and I'm dropping those shadows underneath it, which is going to make that hair come forward. The more I shadow in underneath it, the more it's going to start to bring the things forward that I'm running those shadows off. So we got a little bit of those orangish tones. 
and these colors are l even a little bit more vibrant than um, what my end result is going to be as a matter of fact off the top of that forehead where I put that red violet and you saw me put that red violet up there I actually have a mix that I'm going to be using some sepia and I'm going to actually it's one point later I'm going to be mixing sepia with a little bit of black for a few of the very very dark spots um, I also should point out my background on this I know it looks black on the screen but my black background on this painting is red violet mixed with black and that creates a very very dark mix that looks black at first glance but it still has those warm under undertones and it's a little bit less clashy um you know i've talked before about you know straight black i use black to mix with a lot i don't lay a lot of straight black in too many places but uh you know unlike many people who will tell you not to mix with black i would completely disagree with that i use black to mix a lot but i rarely spray pure blacks in now we are into a sepia tone and notice how I'm coming in here working up my darks and then you'll see I'm going to use my shield there and watch when I pull that off that little bit of um, shadow that's going to come off the edge of the hair as I continue to do that and it's still got more work to go but the more we do that the more it's going to make those things pop out and come forward for you uh, remember that big blowout I had earlier you still can see that over there just over his left eye or her left eye you can still see that big blowout but we're still going to come over and hide it back in a little bit remember about that making mistakes now i'm coming in here this color is um yeah sepia and burnt umber i'm pretty positive right now and that's got some of these darker tones in here but we still haven't reached the maximum and I'm gonna, so I'm gonna spray around a little bit. Notice when I'm spraying, when I'm getting coverage, notice how my airbrush is in constant movement. This isn't like, you know, this isn't like one of them paintings where we're sped up eight times speed or something like that. Um, you know, so this is really close to real time. I've got this sped up just a little bit, just to cut a little of that time down, but it's only at 150% speed is what my actual speed boost is on it so when i'm moving like that and you see that airbrush moving around i literally am moving the airbrush constantly now some of you may recognize my old friend blackbeard wheat and i'm going to use it just to create a little bit of texture to help me along um, not going to rely on it very heavily in this picture but it does help me, you know, along in a few places just to keep from having a, a sterile and straight blend in places. You notice that blend off the forehead on the right hand side um, of your screen, getting close to the uh, hair that flops down in front is a little bit off looking. It's not a big deal. We'll take care of that. Notice how I lay that shield in there and then work off of that in the direction of the flow that comes up the ear. And that gives me that break where I was talking before about make sure that your direction of flow is going in the right direction. Um, you know, because you want that crisp se separation between that clump of hair and the hair that's behind it. Um, you know, and that is an easy way to create the change direction that you have going on between that i'm using my shield around the outside edge for a little bit of shadowing but also notice i'm going to use that to create the streaks in between the hairs if you saw that just immediately um then come in here and shade in a little bit in the front and again using that shield where there's a change of direction in the fur flow so that i don't have to do a whole lot of work i can just make my airbrush go the direction of the of the of the fur and you know it's i've told people many times getting used to putting in a lot of your textures with the airbrush 
you know, and you could freehand it all if you really wanted to, or you could just do scratching and erasing, but using your airbrush to create a lot of that line work, you know, get those dagger strokes in there will really take you a long way and you don't have to put so much work into trying to create textures with other, you know, tools. In this case, you know, I mean, I'm all for using tools, obviously. Um, very open about that. Don't care if you freehand a picture or what you do as long as it looks good in the end. But at the same time, to abandon um, the use of freehand work and the use of creating textures and direction and flow of your airbrush, I think is foolhardy because that leaves you with a lot more work to do working on those little areas that's chaos underneath that hair right there so um, coming back and notice that i used lots of different types of racing i actually love using the back side of a number two pencil eraser on a lot of stuff and then of course i've got a little soft erasing right there and then a little bit of hard with my large fiberglass scratch pen Obviously, as I was saying, you know, coming through with various types of textures and racing. Now, what I'm going to do is go through uh, the fixture and start pulling out, um, you know, still working on, you know, pretty major shapes. That's the reason I'm using things like the large fiberglass scratch pen and using things like, you know, larger erasers because I still have no point pulling out small individuals hairs I'm pulling out chunks of hair um, as a matter of fact there is no place in which I use the blade throughout the entire picture so at no point did I ever pull out an exacto knife um, the closest to a really small line that I pulled out was using my small two millimeter fiberglass scratch pen which can cut really, really thin and really, really small in its own if you turn it to the side. Um, but not quite as fine as a blade. Another reason I don't want to use the blade, um, you know, because this is just so much faster than working on a blade. Blades are great when you're trying to get in those, you know, small single strands of hair and they work really well for that they also work well for some other stuff um in here up on the top of this actually what i've got here is i'm going to use a little bit of steel wool and i'll pull out some stuff right here on the forehead and i want to actually put a little bit of a circular motion in it. if you were to look back at the reference that hair is you know not just small hairs the it starts to bundle up and the hair runs over on top of itself. It gets a little bit messy right underneath that bow in the picture. And that uh, using that steel wool to scratch back a little bit is a very quick and easy way for me to kind of simulate that lots of fuzzed out, funny looking hair. And we're back over here to the spot where I had that blowout in earlier. We're starting to deepen in, bring in the shadows around the eye. Obviously, I did not put the eyes in and the nose in first in this particular case. Sometimes I will with images and sometimes I won't. And in a lot of times that really depends on my mood. Unless for some particular reason I need to get in there first. I do have to pull some hairs over the top of these eyes. So I will get them in before I finish the image. I've heard a lot of people say they like to put the eyes in first so that they know beforehand if they're going to get the eyes right because if the eyes right, the image looks right. And they want to make sure they get the eyes right before they continue on with the image. I don't even look at it that way. Um, I go into the painting knowing without a shadow of a doubt in my head that I can make the eyes look right. Um, and 
that's not even that's not a boast that's not a brag that is simply knowing that i'm going to be able to create that there's nothing more difficult about the eyes than there is in any other part of the image so you have to approach it that way and that's not to say you can't get anxiety going into a painting um every painting that i start is still to this day you know it's like how am i going to do that um I start to approach, develop a plan of attack in my head, decide about how I'm going to create and render this image, and then repeat to myself repeatedly when the painting starts looking really bad and I know it looks bad, I have to repeat to myself over and over again to trust the process and know that the process is going to get you where you want to go. What happens with a lot of people, especially something that's tedious like fur, is, you know, and this happens with the painters when they get started, especially when you start with airbrushing, it's very easy to create an image that looks okay, passable, sort of reasonable, pretty quickly, and it looks good while you're building it. But when you start getting into layers they're gonna have some really ugly layers and those ugly layers are all part of the painting and they have to exist so you have to start to learn to trust a process you know not necessarily you have to follow the process i'm using even but you have to get a definite plan of attack and a process together that you start to learn to build upon and you start to learn to trust. Um, if you don't have a plan of attack that you start to trust, that's when things get weird because what happens is you look at something and you think, oh, that looks really bad, I've ruined my painting. And you stop and you abandon the process that you started on that you know will work and you can't give up on that process you can fix just about anything well you can fix anything it's just a question of whether the time to fix it is quicker or starting over again but there's very very few instances in which you need to completely abandon a painting and start over again usually we abandon paintings thinking we've ruined them it's our own psychological hang-ups that cause us to do that and so that's important to know anyway guys came in here with some of those more of those umbers they're a little bit darker and those are toned down uh, so I probably mixed a little bit of blue with with some umber just to you know tone that color down and desaturate a little bit make it a little bit darker now that I got a lot of color to work with again now I'll come back through hit my high spots that I need back with my erasing see I've got my pencil eraser out there that's one of my um, slightly aggressive pencil erasers um, but you see how I'm working that it's really really light I just go through here and quickly and stroke very fast pull those out if I need a big chunk I turn my pencil to the side pull out a big chunk um, use the blunt tip depending on how sharp the tip is on my pencil and then change different tools you see i just grabbed a large eraser there and i'm going to pull out more stuff but i'm not pulling back to white still at any point in time most of this is pulling back to that base layer color i do kind of find a kind of <clears throat> all right guys that's gonna do it for part two of this one so we still got a little bit more work to do. I'll have part three out tomorrow. It is very early in the morning. And I'm over here doing the overdubs for part two. And uh, we'll have part three out for you tomorrow. So I had part one out yesterday, part two out today, and part three tomorrow. If you're new here, um, don't know why you're at the end of part two of this video instead of part one of this video. But hey, if you're new here, hit that subscribe and notification bell. And if you liked the video, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, give me a thumbs down. But you probably didn't get this far if you didn't like the video anyway. But we appreciate you guys stopping by. I will get back with you tomorrow. Y'all have a good one.
Bye.